Good evening and thank you for joining us. Thunder Bay's iconic Eaton's building is just a couple of months away from being able to host shoppers once again like it did decades ago. The goods and company market is occupying most of the main floor of the building, transforming the former department store into a home for two dozen small shops. And today, they got some financial help from the CEDC. Corey Nordstrom explains. The marble building at the corner of Court Street and Red River Road has been relatively unused since Eaton's moved out of the space in 1997. But things are changing in the building as it will soon house retailers and food vendors thanks to its new owners, Goods & Co. Market. An 18,000 square foot marketplace on the main floor will offer a flexible layout and that concept was at the forefront when owner Maylin Hurley created the new space to accommodate 25 vendors. Over the years we're going to see lots of, of flow and change through the space which is kind of how I've set up the space so that it can adapt to those changes. Um, I think that uh, yeah, I think that's the most exciting part for me is to see businesses come through and grow in this space. To aid in the work that Goods & Co. are doing to the historic building, the CEDC has provided $130,000 from its hotel tax fund to Hurley's company with conditions that it adds to the local tourism scene. It's a great reason uh, for uh, visiting family and friends to come down and just the capacity that it's going to add to the whole tourism mix in the downtown is going to give uh, uh, visitors uh, lots to see and do when they're back in Thunder Bay again. Connecting with our local hotels, making sure that when people come to Thunder Bay, they're staying longer and staying overnight in our hotels. I think that's the main goal for this. Um, I think that uh, this type of market space is very unique to the area. Uh, we don't have anything like it right now. The COVID-19 pandemic delayed the opening of the marketplace in the 83-year-old building, but it's set to welcome customers in the early fall. Hurley knows that may coincide with the fourth wave of the virus in Ontario, so she's planned accordingly. We did make a, an effort to make sure that we had um, a, a certain percentage of food vendors um, and retail. So hoping that with farmers markets, if you have a certain percentage of like grocer or food service type businesses, you're still able to stay open as um, deemed uh, essential. So that was one of the goals with trying to fill the space and making sure we had a really great balance. Corey Nordstrom, TBC News. With kids going back to school in just over two weeks, local teachers unions are hoping to see younger children approved for COVID vaccinations. This week, the province announced that all kids born in 2009 can get the shot, even if they're still 11 years old. But for children younger than that, there is still no timeline from Health Canada. The province has been working on a preliminary plan to administer vaccines for the younger age groups. Once these vaccinates are once those vaccines are approved for kids born after 2009, Lincoln Elementary Teachers President Mike Judge says there still are questions that need to be answered, such as can vaccinations be ready to start on the day of approval, and how much will they help achieve herd immunity? Judge says there's also the increased risk that kids who aren't vaccinated come back to school in large groups may be subjected to the virus. As soon as there is medical information saying it's safe to move forward with vaccinations for our younger youth. I think anything we can do to facilitate that process, to make it move as quickly as possible, is a tremendous step forward. Uh, if first we get the green light to get those vaccines rolling for, for our youth, and B, if there are going to be vaccination clinics on site uh, at schools or within uh, you know, close distances to schools, so that it facilitates this process for all families. Judge says we just have to wait and see as there's new information coming out every day, and he is looking forward to the Ford government pushing for child vaccinations to be approved in Canada. Meantime, Ontario's Progressive Conservative Party is in damage control mode after a barrage of complaints about a new fundraising effort. Those complaints were lodged after some party supporters received campaign funding requests, requests that look more like bills. Colin DeMello has that story. When supporters of the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party received these fundraising letters, it immediately left them confused. I was surprised because I, that, I think it's, it reminds me of like these scams that you get, these phone calls saying that this is CRA and you owe money and if you don't pay, we're going to arrest you, right? <laughs> that's, that's how it seemed to me. So it's, it's very deceiving. They're trying to trick someone, right? 
After days of silence, the Ontario PC party is finally responding to the situation. In a statement, the party says, at no time was it our intention to mislead valued supporters. This correspondence, the party says, was sent to a limited group of supporters by one of our vendors and will not happen again. The question remains, however, how did this happen in the first place? Those who have worked on political campaigns in the past say fundraising is often contracted out to third parties. Political parties, their political office, especially before and after elections, are very small and tiny. And so a lot of their operations is either outsourced to volunteers or in the case of fundraising, often outsourced to third parties. So this is completely normal. But PC party sources say historically, the leader of the party or an advisor would personally approve fundraising emails sent out. The things that do get done by third parties, it's approved by someone. And someone in the PC party uh, approved this. They said that this was okay to go out the door. The address listed on the fundraising campaign leads back to the Responsive Marketing Group, a Toronto company that boasts online that it's raised $175 million over the years. According to Elections Ontario, the PC party has paid Responsive Marketing $1.7 million in consulting fees since 2019. The NDP believes the fundraising letter violated the law. Yesterday, I was, uh, I was calling this a mail scam because that's what it is. Uh, and we're hearing that uh, this may, in fact, violate some federal laws around, uh, around mail scams. And so we're looking into that right now. At the same time, the Ford government is facing internal strife over vaccinations. The Premier's office has given two progressive Conservative MPPs until 5 p.m. today to get vaccinated or face ejection from the party. I'm surprised that the caucus uh, wasn't able to resolve this amongst themselves. I, I, I think the, the Ford government has put themselves again in a situation where it's lose-lose. Is that they? Sources close to both MPP say they are unlikely to abide by the government's demands. And an update on that story. The ranks of Doug Ford's caucus just got a little thinner. MPP Rick Nichols has announced he will now sit as an independent after refusing to get that COVID vaccination. It comes after the Ford government gave the two members until 5 o'clock today to show proof they'd been vaccinated or they would be kicked out of caucus. The ultimatum was presented earlier everyone. this week, just Thank as the government announced it will require education and health care workers to be fully Scarborough. vaccinated or be subjected to regular Scarborough testing. Now, no word yet on the fate of Scarborough Centre MPP Christina Midas, but at a press conference, Nichols said he and his wife chose not to get the shot taking the Premier up on his word that people have the constitutional right not to take the vaccine. Some of the highway maintenance contracts in this region are seeing some significant changes to ensure there is more oversight for snow plowing and other duties. The MTO has developed a new ministry-directed maintenance contract model, which involves ministry staff patrolling and directing the contractor's activities during and after winter storms. The contractor and its employees remain responsible for plowing and spreading sand and salt. Three new contracts took effect on June 1st. Two of those, for the Marathon and Kekebeka areas, were awarded the to IMOS using the new model. The latest contract for Thunder Bay East, though, will be delivered by MCON Services, but with the contractor in charge of directing maintenance. The MTO says drivers will see an increase in contractor equipment and staff under the new models leading to continued improvements in winter maintenance. The new contracts all have five-year terms. A Thunder Bay man is facing a long list of charges following a theft spree that began this weekend and included a couple of aborted police pursuits. Police began investigating following a stolen vehicle report in which the suspect had borrowed a truck but failed to return it. That truck was then tied to several thefts in the Red Rock and Thunder Bay areas, including a stolen boat, motor, and a trailer. The suspect was spotted a couple of times by police, but pursuits were abandoned for safety reasons, including one instance where officers were almost struck by the fleeing vehicle. Finally, the truck was spotted last night in the Grandview Mall area, and a suspect was apprehended after a short foot chase. The 31-year-old city man appeared in court today and has been remanded into custody. Dirt track racing made a big return to the Thunder Bay area yesterday. The new Dairy Queen Speedway in Oliver Papoonge invited racers from around the region to try out the new track last night. The practice event drew over a thousand fans, which bodes well for next month's Dirt Track Nationals event at the new venue. Kurt Black has details. 
For those with the need for speed, Wednesday brought a sight to behold as dirt track racing returned to Thunder Bay for practice heats ahead of next month's eighth annual Thunder Bay Truck Center Dirt Track Nationals at the brand new Dairy Queen International Speedway, which is nearing completion after construction began in 2012. Owners of Nadine Contracting, Louie and Norm Nadine, were on hand for the track's grand opening, and Norm says he is thankful for everyone that assisted in making this speedway a reality. Yeah, it took a lot of work to get to this stage, but um, with a lot of cooperation from our workers and volunteers, uh, a lot of long hours, we were able to put it together. It's a little uh, premature to say the track's perfect. Obviously, it's going to take more work, but uh, we're getting there for sure. Over a thousand motorsport enthusiasts turned out for the practice heats, which was a clear sign for Louis Nadine how badly the Thunder Bay community had missed being out at the track. We can't believe the number of people that are here. This is like a major turnout for a major event, and uh, it, it shows you how starved Thunder Bay has been for racing over the years, and we're, we're very proud and happy to bring it back to Thunder Bay, and we appreciate the support that everybody's showing. As for local race car driver Joel McLeod, he was thrilled with the track and believes the Speedway will be enjoyed by families throughout the community. It was a blast. You know, it kind of brings everybody together in the city and gives a, the community something to look forward to and do on the weekends and during the week. This is perfect. The Nadines believe once all the seating is in place for race day September 17th, Dairy Queen International Speedway will be able to accommodate close to 3,000 attendees. Kurt Black. TBT News. The president of a natural gas distribution company made up of five North Shore communities isn't giving up hope of bringing the heating source to that part of the region. Earlier this year, the province announced its picks for various natural gas expansion programs, and Lakeshore Gas didn't make the cut. Adam Riley has more. It's been in the works for six years and is estimated to bring hundreds of construction jobs to the North Shore. And despite positive developments in April, hopes were dashed in June when the province announced Lakeshore Natural Gas's $30 million funding request to bring natural gas service to Scriber, Terrace Bay, Marathon, Manitowaj and Wawa was not included in a list of 43 projects getting the go-ahead. LSNG President Daryl Skorczynski says in a debrief with the then Ministry of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, the province told the company other projects ranked higher something he disagrees with. You know, I, I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. Um, you know, we felt we had a, a very strong application. Um, you know, we've obviously had a phase one approval from the Ontario Energy Board. Uh, we did sign a gas supply contract uh, with uh, Sir Terrace uh, based out of Red Rock, which was, uh, you know, a great solution for the North Shore as well. Skorczynski feels the project still does warrant government assistance adding that it is not only a good energy solution, but also an economic driver for the region. He believes, however, they may need to rethink their strategy when applying for funding again. We don't think $30 million, when you look at, you know, really the criticality of the project, as well as, you know, the innovation it's going to bring to the north is too much. Um, you know, this is certainly something we see as transferable for those communities that can't have pipeline, um, including First Nations. So, um, you know, we're thinking if we can structure it in a way that, uh, you know, it's still $30 million, but maybe it's $10 million over three years, um, that that's something that uh, the government will take back and we can continue discussions on that going forward. Skorczynski, who also serves as the Chief Administrative Officer for the Township of Marathon, was at the Association of Municipalities of Ontario virtual conference earlier this month. It was there in his capacity as President of Lakeshore Natural Gas, where he was able to speak with recently minted Energy Minister Todd Smith regarding the future of the project. Adam Riley, TBT News. Heat warnings from Environment Canada continue today as temperatures surpass the 30 degrees Celsius mark for the second day in a row. Boulevard Lake was a popular destination this afternoon for Thunder Bay residents searching for ways to beat the heat. And besides taking a dip in the cool waters of the public swimming area, people were also flocking to the nearby mini putt course. Many families teed off with their lived ones and enjoyed a freezy following 18 holes. But perhaps surprisingly, the city's outdoor patios weren't very busy at all this afternoon. It appears the extreme heat could actually be a detriment to attracting patrons, according to Daytona's restaurant owner, John Collins. It's changed it because people don't want to sit outside when it's 30 degrees unless they have a, under a tent possibly with some air conditioning or something, but they want to sit indoors. So I found it slow there, but the inside is like basically full as much as you can get fit in there. 
they want to be indoor where it's a little cooler. The tough year for restaurant operators continues. Now the heat's driving.